What will the end be like for the lost? So we want to tackle that one tonight. What will the end be like for the lost? And this is important for us to discuss because of the fact is, uh, I hope that everybody that's hearing and watching and sitting here tonight is saved. And you're sitting there saying, I don't have to worry about it. But here's the thing. The Bible explains what happens at the end for those that don't know Jesus Christ. And if it's in the Bible, it's important for us to study it. And I think it's important for us to do this because it stirs our hearts for us to see kind of what's coming. For some of you who have heard this stuff, some of this it's new. Uh, but I, I want to do this. And then the next question that we'll get, finish up after this, what will the end be like for the saved? And I'm just going to kind of draw a timeline and walk through what the Bible says of the different things that will come from the millennial reign to, you know, this uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, what is judgment like for Christians at the end? All those kind of things. Uh, that what is the second coming involved for Christians? Uh, those kind of things. So we'll go through there. So uh, I want to look at this. So the world will um, end with seven years of tribulation. And that's not anything that people debate. Some people debate whether we'll go through it. Or some people will debate whether we'll be pulled out. The rapture before that. But we know for certainty that the world ends with seven years of tribulation period. Seven years. Seven years of God judging the earth. There's no doubt that that's what that seven years is about. Seven years of Satan being loosed to do what he's wanted to do all this time. And uh, I, would, I would like to create a timeline is what we want to do is for those seven years of what's going on. And I want to state some facts. There are some aspects of this that we simply don't know. And I say that just because I've grown up around teaching and stuff like that where people come in and say this is this. And I've kind of explained some of this in the, in the past. There are some things that I'll see on Facebook and say, beware, this is the mark of the beast. Unless you can take me to a verse that says what that is, you're not correct. I'm just being honest. You're not correct. The Bible is the only source that we have to be able to line out exactly what these things are. Now, there's some things that we can study to know what they are or not, but there's no way of being able to define what some things are without having all the full picture of that. And the Bible explains that some things are just a mystery. We're not going to know. Some of them are just, you know, the Bible gives us enough information but, uh, to be able to educate us of what the warnings and things, but it doesn't get into all the details of it. So I don't want to speculate with these things. I'll just give you the facts of what we know. And we can kind of like draw some conclusions, but we're not going to draw them as being doctrinal facts. So... What's neat right now is we live, if we're going to start this off, and I just want to lay this out there, right now we are in the church age, the dispensation of grace. So what I mean by that, we live in a time frame that God is giving us every single day that we're alive and breathing and the Lord has not come back, opportunities to be saved, share the gospel, know Jesus Christ and worship him. And I say that just because I'm talking about what things to come and what's going to happen in the future. But man, we need to embrace where we're at right now because we've not yet started this. And it's important for us to acknowledge that to where we have opportunities to share the gospel with those that don't know that. Or for those that don't know Jesus Christ as they listen to this, that they will be able to understand that there's hope right now. Here's two verses that I've given you before, but I want to set this up with this. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and it says, And to wait for the Son from heaven, the rapture, whom he hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So when the Bible talks about the wrath to come, the Bible is very clear when he says that there's wrath to come. Now, I've mentioned this in the past. Some people say when they're talking about the wrath to come, that that wrath to come is literally talking about hell. But let me explain. When we get into Revelation chapter 6, in which we'll be studying tonight, when you get into Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath has come. So there is no denying when we are talking about uh, the judgment of, of, of uh, Revelation, we're talking about the tribulation period, that is the wrath of God. There's no doubt. The Bible describes it there. Who shall be able to stand? It finishes up with this. And God wants us to understand. God doesn't want us to be overtaken with these things. So if you start in the beginning of Revelation, chapters 1, 2, and 3 talks about the church age. We're studying that right now on Sunday morning, the letters that Jesus writes to the church. We get into the second part in Revelation 4 and verse 5. We have this visual of heaven. And we've kind of touched on some of those things in the past. We'll look at a little bit of this tonight. And then when we get into the following chapters in chapter 6, it starts the tribulation period. And we believe that the rapture happens in chapter 4. And when, if you haven't um, 
haven't studied that with us, you can go back and look at that because we see in chapters 4 and 5, we see them casting the crowns before Jesus. We see worshiping them that are the, worshiping Jesus that are the redeemed. We see those clothed in white. We see Jesus sitting on the throne. We see Jesus called as the Lamb of God. So we see all these things that make sense that that is Christians before Jesus. But then we start in chapter 6 and we get in the tribulation period. The tribulation period is divided into halves. So three and a half years and three and a half years. The first part of it is just the tribulation period. Some reference the second half of the tribulation period as the great tribulation period. We will get into that part next week. And so within this, there's three sets of judgments. At the beginning of it, there's seven seal judgments. Then we get into the seven trumpet judgments. And then we roll from there into the seven vile or the seven bowl judgments. As we go through there, they get more intense, more intense. And we start off with this uh, regular of the seal judgments. So I want to take you as we get into this, and you can even follow along in your Bible as we do this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll start setting the stage for this. And we're talking about for the lost, for the lost, those that don't know Jesus Christ, what is going to happen? Now I'm starting off in heaven. And thank God for us that are saved, we can say, okay, I'm here. I'd rather be here than what I'm about to talk to in a minute. And he says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside of it sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So we had this visual of heaven. And they have what you would say, I've heard in the past described as like a deed. And on top of that deed that was sealed up with these seals that were uh, in, 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 like sealing it up. And nobody could open it up because you had to be worthy. You had to be authority. You had to be power to be able to do these things. And it describes Jesus in this passage as the lamb. And the reason why is because it is talking about our victory. It's talking about the lamb that is overcome. Without Jesus coming to be the lamb of God, the Bible says the lamb of God does what? takes away the sins of the world. So even the very description of Jesus in there is reassurance to us that we're talking about our Savior. He is worthy to open the seals. He is the one that conquered sin. He's the one that overcame. He's the one that holds the keys. We read that in Revelation chapter 1. So they're drawing this description in verse 6, and he says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. So the one that they're honoring, the one that they're glorifying in that passage, they're acknowledging him, and he is the one that is standing, the one that is not dead, but the lamb that is alive, and he's standing there. He is the one that they call on to open up the seals because he is the one worthy to do so. When we get into Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, you can imagine this picture in heaven as they begin to open up what is about to happen, and they begin to peel off these seals. They begin to open it up one by one. And only Jesus Christ has the authority and the power to do this. So we turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. and We begin the seal judgments. We begin the judgment that's coming upon the earth. And I saw in this first seal one is the introduction of the Antichrist. We're going to spend a little time talking about this. Because if we don't understand the Antichrist aspect of this, it's going to be hard to understand what's going on through the remainder of the tribulation period. He says, and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat uh, had a bow, and the crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. It's very symbolic. Let's break this down is what we're seeing, because every description of this white horse is teaching us something. Number one, it was a white horse. White is a symbol of peace had a bow in his hand, which is a symbol of war, authority, or power. Had a crown on his head that was given unto him, which is, represents authority or leadership. And then this is being taught uh, by Jesus Christ. If we go back uh, to Matthew chapter 24, and a lot of people get so confused with Matthew 24 because they're not lining it up with the right thing. When the disciples were talking to Jesus about the signs of the coming of the end, A lot of times we're wondering if it's end times, everything leading up to the seven years, or if it's actually the seven years that he's talking about. But it says in Matthew 24, verse 3, and this is just a parallel to this, and he that sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming and 
of the end of the world. Now it's talking about, uh, some of this is talking about the coming of Christ's return for the church. Some of it is talking about the end of the world. And some of this is talking about the second coming of Christ when he comes at the very end at the battle of Armageddon. So we've got to be careful not to mix things up when we read Matthew 24. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now listen how he starts us off. Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. Now here we are that begins just like Revelation does with the introduction of the Antichrist. The introduction to the one that's going to deceive. See, everything that Satan does He does to mimic what God does. He is an angel of light. He's a deceiver. He is a liar. He wanted to be equal with God in heaven. He was kicked out for that, the rebellion that he had. So we get into this and we begin to get this description of who the Antichrist is and what he does. So let's look at the Antichrist. So because, first of all, he is the image of the representative of what happens if all Satan's work is we get through the seven years of tribulation. Number one, let's look at this. He will be a false Christ. He will be a false Christ. And I know we know that because we're like, he's the Antichrist. Uh, Another way to say that, he's the false Christ. He's the imitator of Christ. He's against Christ. There's different ways to put that. But the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 5, for many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And shall deceive many. You see, like I said, Satan mimics everything that he does. Jesus came representing hope. Jesus came representing truth. Jesus came to give hope. Jesus came to give answers. Jesus came to be the Prince of Peace. So you've got to understand, if all these things are what Jesus said that he would be, that Satan's going to come in and give a false representation of that. He is subtle. He's deceptive. He is a liar. So I want you guys to understand that when we see in Revelation this leader that's coming in to do all these things, he's coming in as a false representation of everything that Jesus said that he was. See, the world needed Jesus Christ because the world was in trouble. So you guys got to understand, when we begin Revelation, uh, the tribulation, the world is in trouble. So Satan comes in to be this false representation of hope. Jesus warned that they would come saying, I am he. That that people would come saying that he was the Christ. He would come as hope. He will step into a world and draw all men unto him, just like Jesus did. It's what he's going to do. It's, it's, it's the, the power of what he came to represent. He will claim to be the answer that the world's looking for. Isn't, isn't that odd? Because Satan's even doing that today. Satan claims to be the answer during this time of what the world's looking for. Let me say Satan still does that today. Satan still does that today in representing false answers. When people are looking for hope or answers or answers to depression or identity, he gives these false answers to this. Number two he will be a great deceiver. Now I'm going to answer this or describe this because of this. Have any of you guys ever thought of before, if God takes us out of here in the rapture, now think about this, just just in everyday common sense, if, if, if there was, and I don't know how many Christians are in the world, but if all these Christians just suddenly disappeared, don't you think everybody would look around and say this, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say that there'd be a rapture and all of a sudden all these church people are missing? What in the world happened? We missed it. Jesus came back. The Bible was true. The pastors were right. All these things were true. Have you ever thought that? How in the world does it get away with that? How does all that transpire and the world not just wake up in a moment and say, wait a minute, this makes sense. Now we understand. See, if the rapture happened and everybody was missing, and wouldn't you think that the world just rise up and say, oh, stink, we missed it. Oh, and what, what happened with this? The Bible describes uh, the deceiver. The Bible describes the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. You've got to understand how he works this. You've got to understand what's going on. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, that that day shall not come except there be coming falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition, which we've studied that, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he that is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself to, that he is God. So we see this false representation, this antichrist. He placing himself as authority or as God or answers or truth. He comes in saying he has the thing that's going to make things get better. Look at these next verses. We've looked at this before. Second Thessalonians 2.7 For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
Only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Why can't Satan do what he wants to do now? Why is it that we read in the book of Revelation of all these terrible things happening? You're saying, man, if Satan has the authority and the power to do all those things, why isn't he doing it right now? Because he can't. There's something that stands in the way. The Bible says, he that, will, that letteth will let. It literally, there, there's the hand of God stopping him. We describe it as the church, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of us. You know, the Bible says, and I will build my church, and what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Literally, there is, there is this block sitting there that Satan wants to literally tear things apart, ruin the world, and do all these things. He can't. Until, the Bible literally says, until Jesus, until God takes him out of the way. When the, when the church is out of the way, when the dwelling of the Spirit of God is out of the way, when all these things are there, and then he says, all of a sudden, he has the ability to do these things. Conviction, truth, is taken out of the way. The ones preaching on the radios and preaching on TV and the church going out and witnessing and people being the truth representing in the family. No one will rise up and call them out. There will be this great deception. See, now Satan, without the restriction of the church and the Holy Spirit and everything, now all of a sudden he's able to do what he's always wanted to do. The lies, the deception, the manipulation, all these things. And without the church, the gates of hell will prevail. And that's what's going to happen. It says in verse 9 of Thessalonians, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, you hate to even think like this, but literally the power that's given to the Antichrist is this. He will come convincing with lying wonders. He's going to do miraculous things. He's going to be working in a spiritual power of Satan. He's going to do all these things. Again, you can read that and say, wow, he really is mimicking everything that Jesus did. Jesus came in to do all these wonderful things. That's what the Antichrist does. It's what's happening in this. Verse 10. With all deceivableness and run righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They rejected the truth. I say, I, I almost want to stop and just preach this right now. I wish people understand as we see what's to come in the tribulation period and the fear of all these things, but to stop right now. The reason that people go through that is because they reject the truth of Jesus Christ. Did you notice the wording of this? It doesn't just say that. It says they receive not the love of the truth. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Man, it's not laws. It's not rules. It's, it's a savior that came and he died and he loved us and he wants us. Jesus came to show the love of God to us. All this is represented here. In verse 11, it says... And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions, and they should believe a lie. Not that God deceives. But here's the thing. A world that constantly is saying, we don't want God, we don't want prayer, we don't want church, we don't want your religion, we don't want to hear what's right and wrong, we don't want all these things. When God pulls out his church, it's literally like, like a dam. It's just pulled out and everything's able to pile right in. It's, it's, it's the sending is literally the removing of the power of God from the presence of stopping this, of dividing this. And we see this. God gives them what they want. You know why we have so many problems in America? It's not because God doesn't love America. It's because God's literally giving what they want. When they kick God out of school and government and homes and family and entertainment and everything else, we remove God, we remove the power. God gives them what they want says that they will believe strong delusions in that verse. And they should believe a lie. How does Satan pull off everything that he does in the tribulation period? Now here's one of those things that I'm not going to fill in the blanks because I don't know. But this is what I do know. That when the, the Antichrist arrives and he shows up, this is what happens. There's extreme lies. There's extreme deception. There's a, there's a false representation of answers through him coming to, to set himself as, up as God. We get to the end of Revelation and it gives this, looking back. And it says in Revelation 19 verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, even which deceived them. The describe, description of literally of them is dis, deception. Later in uh, Revelation 20 verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Literally, the very description that we have in both of these situations when we're talking about the false prophet, 
uh, we're talking about the Antichrist, and we're talking about Satan. The, the very work that they do on people, and especially during the tribulation period, is deception. To, make, to lead them to a false truth, to, to lie to them, to water down the truth, to make them believe something that is not true. That is what's going on. Isn't it, think when we talked about him being a false representation of everything that Jesus is, you know what the Spirit of God does. It comes in to convince us what is right. What's happening during the tribulation period is a great deception in convincing them what is not right. Let's see what happens from this as he will offer a false peace. When Jesus was introduced, he came to be the Prince of Peace. The world needed peace. Peace is described as a calm assurance or a rest within the soul. There's a lot of ways to describe it. The Bible says in verse, uh, Revelation 6-2, when he's described, he says, And I saw and behold a white horse. He came in, came in to the world bringing peace. Now, there's a lot of things that we could draw from this. But something extreme had to happen to set up or come into a world that needed peace. Now, you guys tell me at the very beginning of this what just happened that would bring in chaos to the world, that the world would need peace. And it's the rapture of the church. And all of a sudden, we've, we've gone through a couple of things. Now, we, we know what it's like for the world to be a little distraught. We saw that with 9-11. When 9-11 hit, let me tell you guys, I remember being in the paint aisle of Lowe's in, on Bryce Road, I remember getting a phone call. I remember answering it. I remember them saying, are you new? Jenny called me and said, are you near a TV? The trade towers was just hit. I had no idea how much our world was going to be changed from that, from that moment on. And guys, as you know, that we're still, America's still not the change or, or, or the same as it was from that moment on. Something of that magnitude changed the world so much, threw us in chaos. We had economic fallout. We had the, the foreign countries were locking down, all these things that were happening. Now you can imagine what would it be like on an epic scale of Christians being raptured out of the world like that. And I know even for us to even talk like that, it's like, whoa, that, that doesn't even make sense. But something had to transpire in order for the Antichrist to come in to say, I give peace, peace. Even the Bible explains, is woe unto them when they come in and cry out for peace, peace, chaos, confusion, fear, economic fallout, all of these things. So the tribulation period begins with the Antichrist. He is a false Jesus. He is a false hope. He's a false answer. He comes in with power. He comes in as a deceiver. And he comes in ushering peace. So in your mind, you understand People are like, oh, at the beginning, like, we're not following the Antichrist. No, he, just the same way that Eve was in the garden, she didn't go and say, oh, there's Satan. I'm not, you know, I'm not listening to you. No, he was able to slither right into the middle of their lives and them not recognize the evil that was represented. It's the same serpent, the same evil that's there. So the tribulation period begins with seal number one, the Antichrist. And let me tell you this, I don't know. Because I don't know. I don't know this. But let me say this. The very life of whoever that is could be alive today. And I know though that the way that he works and people have said, is he, is he more like a fallen angel? Is he a political leader? Is he a lot of things that we don't know? So when people come out and say, I bet you he's the Antichrist or one or, I mean, it's such a, a stab in the dark. The Bible talks about this person sweeping in out of nowhere and coming in to introduce, to an, bring all these answers. So, Unless the Bible says, you can draw conclusions and point to as many people as you want, but we just don't know. Here's what happens in seal number two. War and slaughter begins. We, serve, we see our world in a mess right now, but let me tell you, we're just seeing samples of what it's going to be like in the end. This is just the beginning. People rejecting authority. People rejecting God. People rejecting rules and regulations and things. In verse four, and there went out another horse that was red. And the power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So the red horse comes in representing blood. It represents war. It represents uh, pain and suffering. It says to take peace from the earth. Do you know why the Antichrist can't give peace? Because he is a false representation of what is real. And a lot of times in this world right now, whatever Satan gives to offer peace, it's not real peace because he is a liar. It, it is a false 
uh, representation of something that's going to make you feel better or get you through. Only Jesus Christ can give peace. War breaks loose. Lawlessness, division, fighting, killing one another. The Bible describes all these things going on, that they should kill one another. Isn't it interesting that we can kind of see a sample of that today? Of when the world goes chaotic and people are not getting their way and things are going wrong, that just lawless lawlessness begins to come in. The Bible describes this great sword, a great instrument of death. We don't know what that is, but the Bible says there's a great sword represented. Something happens during this time. It's, a, it's like a domino effect, a chain reaction. What comes next? The Bible begins to describe famine. When they had opened the third seal, I heard uh, the third beast see, say, come and see. And behold, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on it had a pair of balances in his hand. It went from war to, to food supplies being destroyed, the economy being shut down, and the pair of balances was literally, we, we see that in today, it was, a, it was a measuring thing for money. And he had that in his hand, it's representing that it, all these things are happening, but it's representing the economy or the economy uh, fallout. We've seen that even through COVID-19. And what is something like that? Uh, I, I went to fix something in my house and it was on back order for like four weeks. And they just said, you've got to understand with all the manufacturing shut down around here, that there's just a lot of things that you're just not going to get. A lot of things because of it having the chain reaction of the plants shutting down and the manufacturing and things being shipped in from overseas. But think about that during that time with all these things happening. Uh, trucking companies not running, store hours changing, people are laid off. Sometimes we look at this and we're thinking, man, what would that be like? It's just weird that that would happen. All of a sudden the money's gone. No, if you look at what happens when there's war, if you look at what happens when there's fighting and division, these things naturally follow. It says in verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. That was literally talking about inflation. For what would take for a handful of food would be a day's wage. People can't survive. There's no money to keep things going. Jobs are shutting down. All these things are not working. The Bible talks about, but save the oil and the wine, which is talking about the things of the rich. The rich rise up to be able to reserve things that the poor people can't. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence. Famine is literally just scarcity of food. You know, see what's happening is literally it's just the end. Sin is taking its course. I, I hate to put it like this, but we all know of people that have been sent, uh, sick. You have something going on in their life, and the closer you get to where that disease takes its course to your life, the weaker that person gets. The world is getting weak. The world is getting sick. The world is falling apart. It brings this. It brings death. Because that's what sin does. The seal number four is literally death. And he that opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth beast of saying, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on it was Death. And he followed with him, and the power was given unto him for the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now you think about this. I tried doing the math on this today. Now, right now, in our world, there's 7.6 billion people. 7.6 billion people. Now, if you were to take out during the rapture the Christians, I don't know. I couldn't even guess how many people are in the world that are Christians around the world. I, I don't know. But if you were to take a section of them out and then take a quarter of them during this time that die, a quarter, it would, it would just guessing be one point something billion people that dies. One point something billion people that dies according to this. It's describing in this of death. And we, we think of World War I, World War II, how many died of the, the Spanish flu and uh, just different things through the years. We, we get the reports of uh, COVID-19 deaths around the world and stuff like that. Over a billion people will die. What do you, what do, you do when a billion people die? You see, now there's disease and there's all these things that happen. Look at verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat out was death. And it starts describing it to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. Let me explain that just a little bit. The sword is weapons of some sort. 
Whether people fighting in the streets, whether it's a matter of people fighting as for war, a nation against nation. The Bible describes hunger going on during this time. People just being out of work. People being out of uh, jobs. They're not being, that right now, even with COVID-19, we have some of our missionaries that are like trying to get to different villages and stuff because of COVID-19. There's literally zero food for them to even feed their families to survive. Then it says to kill with death. And that's kind of a weird thing to say. You know what I'm saying? Who says to kill with death? That is any kind of thing that is killing people other than hunger and with the sword. In Matthew 24, verse 7, it mentions the word pestilence, pestilence disease. If you think about a fourth of the world dying, they could not bury them fast enough. There's not enough funeral homes. There's not enough embalming. There's not enough caskets. All of these things, there's a chain reaction that happens during this time. Disease brings about disease. Then the Bible describes that even the beast that would come out. And I know that's weird for us, but you've got to imagine that if there's all these dead bodies and all this, and I, and I know I'm sitting here talking like this and people are going to sit there and say, this sounds like science fiction. Uh, science fiction of today has, has, cannot even touch what the Bible describes of the tribulation period of the wrath of God to come. It doesn't. And I think every time, a lot of times when we see these horror films and everything, the, the, the devil is just trying to dull or callous the minds of people so that when we read about the wrath of God or the power of Satan or demonic activity and things like that, we just brush it off as the entertainment. Like, that's no big deal. You can't bring enough at me to scare me. But this isn't a movie. This is what's going on. This is life. Can I be honest, guys, as we talk about going through difficult times, we get upset about having to put on a mask to walk through Walmart. We don't know what it's going to be like when you have so many people dying that they can't even have enough time to bury the dead. And I mean, just, we, we don't understand when we talk about the wrath and, and when the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptive time. We, we don't fully understand what's going on. This chain reaction, disease, wild animals, sickness, death, disease, all these things just multiplies. Seal number five brings in and it describes the martyrs. And he that opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, this brings up a question, and I'm just going to throw this out there, and we're going to answer this later. And I would love, if you're watching, to send me an email to comment. I would love to hear from the people that are here. What have you been taught? What have you heard? And I'm not just talking about some sort of movie that's been put out in the past. Can people be saved during the tribulation period? Can people be saved during the tribulation period? And I challenge you to look that up and see. And then in our next lesson, we're going to hit that because it comes up a number of times through this study. And, and there's some things that I've heard people say and just from doing a study, I'm thinking that is not right. And I want to show you guys what the Bible actually says. I'm not going to give it away because then you guys won't go looking for it. But I want you to think about that. And, and if people are saved during that, how are they saved? I just, I can't wait to get into that. But the Bible describes those that will stand up during those times that turn to believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that they will be slaughtered. We don't know persecution. Let me tell you guys, we do not know persecution. Our lives are not at stake when, when it comes to life and death situations. But the Bible literally says that we're slain for the word of God. They were slain for the word of God. Then we get into seal number six. And it says, And I beheld when they opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell from the earth, and as fig trees casteth her uh, untimely figs, and when she is shaken in the mighty wind, and heaven departed as a scroll, and then the roll together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. Now this, I would just describe as this, is seal number six is just natural disasters. Seal number six. And, and I've heard a lot of pastors in the, in the past say, what this is is this, and what this is is this. They're talking about like if you shake a, a fig tree and all the figs fall out of that tree of what that's going to be like on the earth. I don't know what that's talking about. I, I don't know if that's asteroids. I don't know if that's, I've heard other people say that that could be missiles being shot from one country to the other. We don't know. 
But I do know this, that whatever is great things falling out of the earth. The Bible describes great earthquakes. The Bible talks about the sun going black. The Bible talks about the world being shook so much that even the mountains move during this time. The Bible continues in that passage and going on that people will run and literally trying to survive for their life and go to the mountains and hide. We see right now crazy things happening in our world. I mean, you've seen probably some of the videos that have been posted of all, in other countries about all these birds going crazy and, and, and just some of the weird things that have happened, tsunamis, and we see things that have happened uh, with the flooding and stuff like that around the earth. This is just the world when the Bible talks about the, 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 uh, the birth pains, about getting closer to the end, just like uh, somebody having a baby and the, the contractions that happen, the closer you get to the end, the more the pain gets intense for them. And that's what the Bible is describing with this. What would the world be like without the power of God? What would the world be like if Satan had his way? What would the world be like without daily being able to live in the grace of God? You say, what, what about seal number seven? I'll give you seal number seven, but we're not going to like it. Seal number seven is the introduction or the transition into the trumpet judgments. Seal number seven, when that is peeled, we don't know what happens. This is, what, this is the only thing that we know that happens. In chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, And when the seventh seal, when they opened the seventh seal, there was silence. There was silence in heaven for about the space of a half hour. It's a weird thing to say. If I was to give you guys some bad news right now, if I was to tell you that somebody that we love passed away or something that happened in our nation or sometimes there's no words to say. There's just, you're just speechless. You just sit there and all, you, you just tears. And all I know is whatever happens in this transition, and we know that this, the, the, the seal judgments bring us right up to the three and a half year part of all these things that are going on. And obviously, we're just giving little highlights as we go through this. But this I do know that heaven stops and says nothing for a half hour. I, why a half hour? I mean, these are just some of the, the, the mysteries that we have. We get into um, the second half of this. Uh, which we're not going to do tonight with the trumpet judgments and things that happen after this. But can I, can I give some application? You say, Tony, why, why are you talking about this? Why, we're not even going to be here. Why, why are you going through Revelation? Because some people say it's over my head. Some people say it's scary. I don't like to talk about it. Some people just say that it's, it's, it's too symbolic and it's just confusing. Can I tell you this? It's we have, we have not mentioned the mark of the beast. Do you guys notice that through all this, we've not mentioned the mark of the beast? What has happened in the world leading up to this point? A lot. I mean, I, we described the most crazy movie that anybody could fo- possibly imagine ever going on in this world. Can we acknowledge, acknowledge that? I mean, it is... Reading these things just gives us chills of the Antichrist and the things happen, the natural disasters and things like that. We are in chapter 8, verse 1 right now. The, 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 the mark of the beast comes in Revelation chapter 13. You say, why are you saying that? I'm saying that to clarify something right now. When people will sit there and see things that happen in the news and say, well, that's the mark of the beast. No, it's not. It's not. Because either the Bible is right or it's not. So unless we have already experienced all the things that we just done, we're not even to the mark of the beast yet. Do you guys get what I'm trying to illustrate? Sometimes our minds are running and we're living there sitting there saying, they're not going to give me the mark of the beast. They can't. Do you guys get that? If we're going to study the Bible for what it says, and I'm trying to set you guys up with this just because of the fact is, here we're going page by page and we're seeing the fact of what God says. And then all of a sudden, we're not even way back here to get to the part of the mark of the beast, but people are sitting there right now saying, that's the mark of the beast. Then, then my question is, what do you do with these seven things? Where are these seven things? Because all these things have not transpired yet. Now, let me just clarify. Are things, is the stage being set? Yes. 
all the, like right now, it's like playing dominoes and, and all the little pieces are being set. We're talking about something going on over here. And yes, these pieces right here eventually will lead to that. But, but sometimes I think we live in fear. Christians are living in fear of something that's not even possible for it to happen right now. We shouldn't live in fear. Do you know what we should live in? Having a firm understanding of the knowledge of what the Bible says. And that's why I, I love to get into this to understand and, and some people have even said through this and said, man, I really think that we're in the middle of the tribulation period. Well, let me show you what the tribulation period is. And if this stuff is not happening in the world right now, then no, we're not in the middle of the tribulation period. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it's important for Christians to be educated. It's important for us to look into the Bible and say, this is what it says. And we're just going in chronological order as we go through these things. Now, the stage is being set. The things are being put in place. Are we close? Could we speculate? Could we guess? Yes, all day long. But all I know to do is stand on the rock. And the rock is Jesus Christ. And the rock is the word of God. And when I stand on that, I know what's true. And I know what's coming. And I know what's happening. And I know what's next because I'm standing on the rock. But I want to close with one small, one big, big thing. I want to... Go back to 2 Thessalonians 2.10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. There, this, the word saved is so powerful. It means to be rescued. Jesus came to rescue us. I am saved today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because in Revelation chapter 5, when it's describing the blood, when it's describing the Lamb of God that had been slain, that is my God. I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ that saved me. That's what it's talking about. And right now is the day of salvation. Right now is, is the opportunity of hope. Right now is the time to get our lives right. Right now Right now, we, we have tomorrow to wake up and serve Jesus Christ and reach people. Right now, for those that play church and, 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 and don't have that peace of God in their heart, and it's not real, right now is the time to, to quit playing games with God and get your heart right. Because this day is coming, and for those that are lost, the Bible describes that he will come as a thief in the night. Be ready. Because now is the time to get ready. It says, be ready because he's going to come at an hour that you think not.